Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell, and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. Hey everyone, welcome to The Binge Factor. I'm Tracy Hazard and I have Lance Keiko as our guest today here talking about Inside the Firm. I love that title. It's so great. It has great implications. He's It's about his architectural firm. So it's definitely about a firm and it just has such nice insights and real authentic openness that makes it really unusual in the scope of all the other ones out there trying to get clients and do other things in his industry. So he's got real transparent there in a really wonderful way. So let me tell you a little bit about Lance. Lance Keiko is a multi-talented serial entrepreneur, architect, builder, lecturer, and podcaster. And he has a diverse background in architecture, construction, real estate development. And he's the co-founder and partner of F9 Productions, a widely successful design plus build firm in Longmont, Colorado. He specializes in single family residential, multifamily residential, and small commercial projects. In addition to his work at F9, he has a family of six. His wife is pretty busy and an active member of his community and a respected industry leader. That's where this podcast comes in because he routinely lectures at the University of Boulder and he has a professional community in the architecture community. This podcast is a driver for more speaking events, other things that he might do in and around the industry. As the co-host of Inside the Firm, he has a co-host along with him, Alex Gore. And Alex and he really do a lot of conversation together about the challenges and the things that they're facing. It's a really popular architectural business podcast and with insights and advice on not just architecture, but entrepreneurship and small business ownership in general. One of the things I think is sorely underestimated in the podcasting world is how a popular podcast, a really interesting and insightful podcast like Inside the Firm can actually lead you to not just better clients and more clients, but it can also lead you to better employees, employees who want to stick around because of you being so transparent and talking about the business so openly. It's one of the things that we use here with our staff of over 80 at Podetize. Here I am talking on the Binge Factor. We talk on Feed Your Brand. And our, our staff is intimately involved in understanding what's driving things, how what clients are thinking about, what we're thinking about. This is a high value to having a firm-based or company-based podcast of some kind. So I'm really excited that we can talk today. Plus, I have a background where I just love architecture in general and love building and love furniture, which is where I come from. So Lance and I really bonded. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. So let's hear it from Lance Keiko, Inside the Firm. Lance, thanks for coming and talking Inside the Firm. I love that name because it it's really, I mean, it has that connotation to the firm. (laughs) And so, but it is so different. Like I don't, I didn't consider myself when I was running a design firm, I didn't consider it. I didn't really consider it an agency. I didn't consider it a business. I, I, it just seemed like a different entity. A firm is much more accurate description. Oh, I'm glad you agree. Yeah. Cause I second guess myself sometimes. I mean, I, I love, I, I think the name is catchy too. And it's, it rolls off the tongue really nicely, but it's like, yeah, what do you call it? an architecture firm. Do you call it an architecture firm? Do you call it an architecture practice? You know, they tell us in school and even my colleagues that I speak with and, and talk with all the time that are practice, other practicing architects is, well, we're always practicing. It's kind of like doctor, like you're practicing medicine. You're you're literally just continually getting better. But yeah, the, the, the firm, the idea with it was, is, is in the name of itself, as we were talking about before we started going live here was we wanted to just bring people actually inside an architecture firm, whether they were people that have worked in 
owned firms for a long time, or they were just starting a business, or they were thinking about starting a business, or even college students. We actually have a lot of uh, listeners that are end up being like college students, and we inspire in that way. And the, and the, the overall arching point of it was twofold. Number one, to bring people in and give them an inside look. And because it, it up until my generation and maybe Gen X, I'm sort of in between millennial and Gen X, the way architecture practices or design firms were run and how they work is felt like everybody had to have a hold everything very close to their chest. And that's just the opposite of what Alex and I have always thought about is like, we, we believe in a, in a world of abundance. One of my favorite Bible quotes is Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply. Like, I don't believe in this idea of scarcity. I think nature and we're from nature, there's plenty of, there's plenty to go around for everybody. So what, what is it going to hurt if we're giving out not even trade secrets, but just how we're working at the end of the day, I just want there to be better architects. I don't want there to be, I'm tired of contractors pitted against architects and, and vice versa. And I'm sure you're aware of that as somebody who was getting furniture fabricated in the field. And the second part of it was the big goal of it was the Gen, Gen Z and millennial generations, I feel like are very dejected in, in a lot of ways where there's this victimhood mentality and like capitalism is all bad. And it's like, yes, there's big problems with capitalism. It's called cronyism, right? But the idea that the American dream is dead is I think a falsity. And I really believe that like that if there's any, I mean, our story especially came from, we had no clients when we first started, we had nothing. And we did it. We started in the middle of the great recession. If we can do it, surely other people can do it too. And we've gotten so much fan mail and just people contacting us for all kinds of amazing advice and just thanking us for, for laying it all bare and, and making it happen in that kind of way with the show. And I think it's so necessary in uh, the particular dynamics of it is so often people want to be a celebrity, right? Mm. That's sort of our influencer celebrity model. That's what every CEO thinks they have to be nowadays. And, and in a, in an architecture firm, I know it's, there's a lot of egos already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's a, a design firm is same, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can't collaborate, if you can't get over that and you can't start working together, you don't achieve the ultimate goal because it's a project. It's, you know, it's not a showcase. Yeah. Yeah. We, and we've gotten, we have gotten, we have had listeners interact with this in almost every single way. We've actually gotten projects from other architects even in the same state of Colorado where we where we are headquartered in that have referred us to clients, high profile clients, very well paying clients and uh without any you know simply because maybe they couldn't take on that typology or it was too far for them or they were too busy. So the whole idea of holding it in close to your close to your vest and getting no return for it is, I mean, we just turn it on 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 its head in that in that kind of way. People reach out to us and want to collaborate with us all the time. And you talk the celebrity part of it is really funny. I think I just got to make the point that I I, I it finally my kids my my children were have been saying this for like several years. Like I just want to be famous. I want to be famous. And I go, well, your dad's kind of famous. And they don't believe me, right? I mean, it doesn't oh, no. even so you have to show them YouTube. So that's what broke through my nine year old. Oh, she said the other day, Oh, mom, you are famous. You're on YouTube. <laughs> uh, so okay. that's what that's what tips the scale at the age group. <laughs> yeah, good to know. So I, I can't remember what book I was reading. I think it was like uh, Hold the Calm or something like that. I don't know what it was, but they said uh, they made the point in that when your children say these things is because they want to be seen. That's all it is. It's it, it, they don't really want to be famous. It's just, that's their way of expressing that they, that they, that they want to be seen and heard and stuff like that. Um, so for us, it was never about fame or anything like that, but I just love that you brought that point up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I do think that that's the case is that we, you know, it's so often, especially in a consulting firm of any kind is that we try to, we, we can't afford to lose a client to somebody else. And, you know, and so you get very worried about having that, but there's this tipping point between publicity, making sure people know how you work and also combating. And I think that's what inside the firm does brilliantly, especially the conversations that you and Alex have together and Alex Gore is your co-host and the the conversations that you have together I think what it really does is it puts foremost this idea of I had a bad experience as a listener with an architect or whatever this I, I you know I don't think I can afford one or and it starts to put out this conversation of I don't think I can afford not to have one mm -hmm. I don't think I can I, you know I think oh my experience was isolated 
that was an exception. And so it starts to to help the industry overall, whether yeah. they're going to hire you or not. So they should all be really grateful for you guys putting the show out. That's exactly what exactly you nailed it. it it's I, I frankly, I just don't care if uh, other people are mad at us for, you know, putting out that kind of stuff, because that's exactly what that's exactly what I want it to be. The other thing it's really done for us is it's actually been a way to keep us hold us accountable. So if if we will come up with strategies sometimes on the fly in, in that basically it's a Friday executive meeting that you're hearing every day on the show. And then it's like, okay, now we got to do that. Like we talked about it on air publicly. Now we have to implement, you know, whatever kind of strategy or new system or improvement we're going to make in the firm. And then, and then it's also us sharing ways where we were already doing stuff like that. Like we, we, one of the, uh, there, we, we try to read a book every year as a firm, as a whole, and then we meet about it. And the, one of the last ones we read was uh, The Two Second Lean by Paul Aker. And it's completely transformed the way we operate our firm. Every single day, we ha- somebody has to present a two second lean idea. They have a different improvement they're going to make and stuff like that. And now, and I hope, and we, we then we explain to our listeners, like, look, here's how it improved us. Like, this is really working, you guys. You guys should do it too. It costs you nothing. The podcast is free. Just make it happen. <laughs> it's it's got it costs time but you yeah. know and i think that's the biggest part for most you know whether it's a, you know a business owner of any kind but the idea of doing a podcast especially one that you do two days a week mm-hmm. where one is outreach and you're doing interview with with you know company owners business owners entrepreneurs ceos all over the place and you're you're started diving into them and their brain and then you have your executive meeting conversation between the two of you so that's a big commitment to taking time to do that each week. And without an immediate financial return on investment, a lot of people don't want to do it. Yeah, of course they wouldn't. Yeah, it's a labor. You know, I just had a colleague come up uh, to the to the office a few weeks ago. I went to school with him. He graduated a few years ahead of me and everything. And he, he wanted to check out the headquarters and everything. And he, he was, once I had him on the show, then he binged on the Monday morning shows, he was just like, they're so good. Like they're, they're perfect 30 minutes or a perfect commute time. And I just, the way you pick people's brains and everything, he's like, you're a pretty good interviewer. I was like, Oh, thanks. Well, you've I, done you know, 500. You, you've he, gotten good at it. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's probably the third thing that it's done is in terms of public speaking, the improvement level that you get to, especially if you pay attention and you should listen to, you know, if you're going to start this, if you're going to start your own show, I think you should start listen to as, as many episodes as it take before you finally get comfortable with your voice and you recognize the uhs and the ums and you really try to get rid of that and come up with better strategies for avoiding those sort of prepositions and everything like that. But, but, but Rhett, anyway, back to Rhett, when he came up, he said, do you guys get paid for this? And I, he goes, it seems like it's just labor of love. And I go, yeah, it, we, we break even now. Basically we break even now. It pays for our time. It actually pays rent. Um, we rent to ourselves with our build, one of our buildings that we own and stuff like that. And he was th- totally blown away that we got paid at all for it. So I, I'm with you. I mean, most podcasters, yeah. you know, I, the majority, you probably would know more than me how much actually monetize versus not. So when I was running my design firm and we ran our first podcast, the 3D print one called WTFFF. So it's really old. We have 750 episodes, if any, or 650 episodes. Sorry, I almost added an extra hundred oh. there. 655 episodes we did on that one uh, before we stopped doing it. But when we were running our firm and doing that, the reality is, is it probably did easily 1.2 million in consulting for me within a year. So it was closing consulting jobs faster. So if, if I looked at it as, did I get paid mm-hmm. for the show. Well, I refused to take advertisers in the beginning. We eventually did, but we didn't in yeah. the beginning. And, um, and that, but I didn't need to because it was the consulting or the, the speed of closure that would happen. And I don't know about you, but in the furniture design world, it would take us six months to a year to close a client. Sometimes it just was a really long sales cycle of back and forth, refining things, getting quotes in place, deciding because then they were going to work with us for three years. So it wasn't going to be a short contract. And so that was kind of part of the model for it. And I could close them in three months, lot half, you know, quarter of the time sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It does take us that long sometimes. I, 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 I joke to everybody, in, including, you know, loved ones that it's an 18 hole course. Yeah. It's an 18. It's like, it's like golf. It's a very long game. You might meet somebody and it might take three to five years. I'm serious. There, there's yeah. a, cases I could probably dig up if I really, really looked that took that long from the point of just touching somebody 
in phone call, email, text, or listening to the show. And then eventually they ended up being clients. So it, it's a long game. It, it is, it, but that's just part of the deal. I think it, it's just a matter of being stoic about the whole situation and like, what a great voice and a, and a tool that you have now at your disposal at any time, even, even if you're frustrated, like that's another probably an outlet that has done for us is, is we don't name names on the show. Right. But so if we have a troublesome client or a troublesome consultant, or, or we've even talked about hiring and firing people without naming them and stuff like that, you, even just having that outlet uh, for, for me personally has been very positive. Well, it helps you think things through. I love that. And I think that's really the specialness of your show is, and the binge factor, as you know, you look, your friend was pointing out that you, your binge factor is clearly how dialed in to this model of business you are. And the fact that you're willing to be open, raw, and have the hard conversations is going to make it a better business. So I want to listen to that because I'm going to learn something from your process. I'm going to learn something from the questions you ask. And that is really powerful because there are so few places. You pointed out earlier, you're the top five architectural podcasts. There aren't a lot of them. Like this is like, but you are the top of that top because you've got over 500 episodes and that is very elite. So I think I did the statistics recently and less than 2% of podcasts ever make it over 500 ever. And of the active shows currently posting and doing that, it's 2% of 2%. Oh my gosh. Wow. So you're making me that, feel special. This is you, what you've done <laughs> is really special. Yeah. And, and we honestly have yeah. no intention of stopping. I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like, uh, that's, there are times where it, I get a little, it's just a lot. Like you said, I mean, I'm I, for me with doing everything I do, uh, architect, builder, podcaster, teacher, philanthropist, all the things like just now I'm kind of narrowed down to like, I have two slots I can do interviews on in addition to the Friday show, but it's so worth it. I mean, even, even just interviewing folks, like I, some authors that I have on every once in a while, there was a gal and I need to start memorizing her name because I keep mentioning her. She just wrote this book. It's called holding the calm. She got halfway through her interview with me and I bought the book in real time on the show. And it was a game changer of a book in, in my life for sure. I just read it maybe five or five or six weeks ago that's got to be some level of like providence, right? That 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 all that happened. Like I, I had love to that have... when that happens. It's just it's one of my favorite things about it is that like you know you really do you meet someone and it was just the thing you need mm -hmm. right at that moment in time. And so yeah, I just I love that about that. I I love that idea that. You're asking for it by putting this out there as a podcast and the universe is delivering it to you right at the right moment in time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Networking too. Like you said, I'm glad you mentioned the networking part of it and how it led to your sales too. I, that's another part of where I, I would say for us, the positives of the podcast have been networking and reaching out. And one of my goals next year is actually to get what is like, for example, one of our, our favorite civil engineer, he's been, on, I think he's been on the show like two or three times. Now he's just extremely loyal to us. We're one of like a very few handful of architect city refers to other developers and the referrals come back. So I think next year, one of my goals is like, I'm just going to cold call and reach out to as many of the prominent general contractors in the Denver Metro area and say, Hey, would love to feature on the show and see if I can get referrals back and forth. I feel like that's kind of where for me, it's probably headed next with the Monday morning shows. Well, and I think it's not just the referral, but it's going to establish this deeper touch point relationship mm -hmm. that you have because, you know, it's great to have a network to have referrals in, but if that network doesn't really understand you, you don't understand them, it doesn't make those referrals as valuable. And I think that's what the podcast has done for me as well. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, yeah, there's, there's just a loyalty that comes about with it. I mean, when you do some like kind of, it's not like a favor, I guess, it's just, there's something about it that people Well, no, you gave them a publicity, whether they, you know, that's yeah. what it is nowadays, right? You've, you've interviewed them, you've given them publicity. So it is in a sense, a good favor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's that law of reciprocity that kicks in there. So, well, you mentioned that you, you break even on the show and, and maybe even make rent with it. And, and so you do take advertisements. What was that tipping point like for you when you said, okay, I really do think we're going to take some ads. Oh gosh. It's a cycle. Like it's so silly. It's a number. <laughs> like I just, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a mastermind group with a couple other podcasters in our, in our sphere. 
uh, I won't name names, but some of, one of one of them is like number one. People can probably guess who, who he is. His name is biblical. I'll give you that hint. <laughs> and uh, literally, uh, so he uh, uh, they were asking. It kind of blew my mind that he was like, "How do you get advertisers?" I was like, "What? Why are you asking me? Like, why are you asking me? I'm just a little old Lance from inside the firm. Like, I'm not I'm not really famous or anything like that." And so I explained to them how it worked. And the big the big thing the tipping point was. I go, we needed 5,000 downloads a month. Like, why did I think that number was necessary? I think for me, usually as a salesman or even somebody, if I go out to like ask a woman on a date or make a new friend or something like that is like, I need, or, or go make a sales pitch uh, to a potential client. I, I have to be confident. So I knew I, for me, it was just not having the confidence and like, what is a number that feels good to me psychologically that I can talk about confidently? It was just, it was just having 5,000 downloads a month. Now we do on average about 20,000 downloads a month. So the goal was always to try to compensate for our time because you made that point earlier. Like it, it's not free time is. Well, especially in a firm, right? <laughs> your billable hours, your, your oh my hours gosh. are valuable. <laughs> right. And then I, you know, and I have, I have uh, four children uh, and a wife and all of that. Like it's a, it's a big, it's a big <laughs> deal. So that's, we always wanted to get monetized in that way, at least get compensated for our time. So for me, the tipping point was just a number. And then after that, then I, then I had no, once I, once people, once we got sponsors and some of our sponsors were like the actually Dell, like Dell actually sponsored us. I think at one, once we hit the 10,000 uh, download a month point for, and which in the podcast world, 10,000 listeners is not a lot. No, but your niche, your, your listeners are really, really niche. And that Thank makes you. a difference. Yeah. Yes. And that's what I was explaining in the mastermind group too, because I go, there's two ways to look at this guys. Cause one of the guys in the mastermind group, he just went from 10,000 down, uh, subscribe uh, followers on Instagram to a hundred thousand, like within a matter of days. Cause he had one piece of content go absolutely nuts. And he goes, so he's asking me the same kind of questions. I go, Hey guys, there's two ways to look at the subscribers numbers or the downloads numbers and all of that. And it's just like Tracy said, if you have a small number, then your argument becomes, I, I am niche. I am, I have a very focused group, you know, potential corporate sponsor or the opposite is like, ah, but I have a, I have a wide reach, obviously that they all, that's the argument. So I think there's a power in both ways. Um, I wish somebody would told me that right away. How about that? So now hopefully <laughs> well, and, somebody's hearing it. Yeah, <laughs> no. And, and this is the thing, look, it's, for my 3D print podcast, just like yours, it was mm -hmm. easy for me to make a decision to take advertisements when we did because it wasn't the advertisers weren't a true alignment. Dell is not a true oh. alignment with you as an architect. Like it's not like you're endorsing something that's, you know, you know, so I could, we used to take Hewlett Packard was our big sponsor. So Hewlett Packard is easy to be, um, it's not going to make me look bad. So there's no association level that I had to worry about at that level, but I also didn't make it cheap because I knew my audience was smaller. I'm, in my case, we did have a hundred thousand a month, but like, so it was a little bit bigger, but yeah, it, you know, it was, it was valuable to them. So I could charge them quite a bit of money for that space. And I did it rarely. So mm. I didn't take constant sponsors. I didn't just like let the streaming ads go on, which are like pays you pennies at the end of the day. For oh, the yeah. Of listeners. Like we'd never do that. Like I think yeah. that that ruins that. But I think that as an architect and as a designer, we I had this perspective and I think you do, too, that the value you've created is valuable. And it's a little bit different than this sort of like, oh, I just am an influencer and I make a hundred posts a day. And, you know, like it's just like, you know, they don't have the same mindset to the value that they've created. So they don't go and ask for enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and then it's like, okay, so value is, value is subjective. It, I mean, if you're, if you're doing like measy and kind of economics, then it's, it's value subjective, right? Okay. Uh, because it's like, well, what is my house worth if I sell it? Whatever, it, whatever it sells for, right? So it's subjective to somebody who's doing that. I, I'm fascinated by it. Like, I, I feel like my value with the podcast, my personal value to it and what I, where, how I see it as valuable keeps evolving. So, you know, I, I, for me, this last year, the big epiphany was, it's like, oh, wow, public speaking is like very easy now. And it's, it, I, there's not a lot of us, us, I mean, and I feel so confident talking to people, just randomly talking to people like, my, my, like in, in, in that kind of way. And so, you know, where does it head next? I, I think it's this ever evolving set of values that keep emerging if you just keep doing it. 
So I think that's why that's one of the other reasons why like, no problem. Let's, let's get to a thousand episodes. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep going. Wonderful. Well, I'm so glad you're going to keep going, but I, you know, I think that that's really a good point. It's like every hundred episodes or so, which, you know, if you're doing two a week, that's a year's worth. It's a good time to sit back and, and evaluate it and say, Hey, this year, I felt like we really did accomplish this with it. I'd like to tackle this next. And you know, what is that? And so if it's more speaking events or whatever, so, you know, you know, you're thinking, I feel that like I'm at, I'm hitting my stride here. That's going to be my goal for next year is to make sure that these generate that you're putting it out there. You're You've created an intention for that. Yeah, yeah. The, and then I, I have you asked me also before we started recording too of what what was my goals of uh, being a guest and guesting on podcasts. I only started doing that just this last year. So I, I the tipping point again for for me to do that was I felt like it was kind of like when we started the show. When we started the podcast, it would have been uh, we would have basically almost got to about year seven when we started the show and then we of having the firm and if the statistics if ever if anybody hasn't heard it is like once you get to year seven as a startup your chances of failing go down so much dramatically like most businesses fail within the first seven years that's what i was trying to say so we didn't fail and it was like oh we should tell our story we didn't fa- holy cow we did it good <laughs> yeah we, we, we should talk about we, we we should talk about it in, in this sort of way so I, I feel I feel I felt the same way when it came to guesting on podcasts as I was like, I'm 40. I, I feel like I'm established and I have some authority in the space and I have some things to tell people. And it wasn't it's not just something if, if anybody Googles me, they will find very personal, personal stories like some about me finding my real dad when I was 33. I'm now 40. Stuff like that, where I'm just completely laying it bare and exposed. So it's kind of been therapy, too. And I I don't know where the positivity is going to come back from that. I'm not that kind of person that says I put good karma out. I'm getting good (laughs) karma in. I just put it out, put it out, put it out, put it out, put it out. And don't think, think of anything back. But I, but I, I, and maybe it will be like you and I were talking about earlier. It's just, just a piece of mail from somebody and say like, Hey, I heard that episode. Maybe like it saved them or something like that. I don't, I don't know, but I know that like, I, I shouldn't keep this sort of stuff bottled up inside. And, and that's, you know, the tipping point of why I do guesting. Yeah, well, that's good. I'm so glad that you do. And I'm glad that we connected up that way to make sure because I mean, it, it totally intrigued me because I was like architecture and design. I don't get to talk about that much. And oh. so like, I, you know, done a lot of financial podcasts, a lot of health and wellness ones here where I interview hosts. And, you know, it's nice to interview in some area that I have an inter- personal interest in and a professional one as well. So I'm so glad you did. You did decide to guest more and reach out. Now, are you doing video yet? Yes, we're on YouTube. So you can Yay! tell, I'm going to tell, <laughs> but you know what? Am I like, my daughter knows I have a fishing channel, a YouTube fishing channel. Like it's not even, a, it's fully monetized. And it's, we have a, one, our latest episode, like 7,000 views, like a, a lot. She still doesn't think I'm famous. Yeah. But we That's made we, famous for fishing dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, ma- we made the transition to YouTube. I think maybe two or three years ago is mm-hmm. we, we finally decided we should, we should be on YouTube uh, as well. So how are you finding time to keep the show at a professional level and, you know, services and all this stuff that you have to do to to produce the show? Because, you know, it's your time on the recording side of things. But how do you kind of keep controls and manage all of that? I'll talk about it in two ways. So the the mon- the Monday show is is different than the Friday show just for gearing up for it. I use this service that... I use podmatch.com and it has been a godsend. Right. That's find, how we met. For, so. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. For, fi- for finding guests and also guesting. And after you get enough authority on there in both ways, it it kind of just trickles in. And if anything, you're just beating people off with a stick, which, which is awesome. It was not like that before when you first started the Monday show. So that's very critical. Um, I have some own, my own personal criteria that I go through when I, when I find guests. I, I'm much like you. I want unique people with a unique story. I like I like when people have a struggle story. I like telling that story of overcoming adversity and not being victims in that kind of way. Like I just really like stories like the movie Rudy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where they just come, they're just like an underdog. Because that's me. That is in my soul. I am an underdog. Grew up in a town of 500 pe- people or less. Very rural Northwest North Dakota Indian reservation. Lower middle class. Now I'm out here crushing it, you know? So I, I, that's, that's how I tackle the Monday show. And like I said, now I just slided it down to like, I use Calendly to book guests 
and I only have two slots Monday and or Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. MST. If we can't make it, we can't make it, and it is what it is. And then the Friday show, I could not do without Al Gore. I'm not even trying to fluff him up here, but like there are plenty of times where it'll be a Friday morning, and I'm it's it's 6 a.m. and I'm texting him. We're preparing the show notes. We try to record at 7 a.m. on Friday. We publish later on in the day. Plenty of times where he's either text me or I text him and I go, I got nothing. What do you got? And he goes, don't worry, I'll cover, I, I, I'll carry the show. And then he carries the show because he has topics and we make it happen. And we have a really good banter and discussion back and forth. As, as you noted earlier, we're best friends. We, you know, we've been best. My kids call him uncle Al. I mean, he's that he's my brother from another mother. I've known Al since 2003. So almost 20 years we've cried together. We've laughed together. He's watched my, you know, he's, he's, Took, taking care of my kids. Um, I've watched his, all that kind of good stuff. That's how we make time for it. But we also make sure we keep a strict schedule. You know, that's the critical you're part You're holding of it. each other accountable for that yeah. time slot together because it is, I mean, that, and that is the hardest part with the cow yes. host that we, I hear. Now, my, my co-host was my husband oh. and yet he would still cancel on me. So we had to <laughs> like, we, we really had to set up a system to make yeah. sure that that happened. And, and one side doesn't feel like they're carrying it all the time. Yeah. And our last adjustment was to move it from, we were doing at 10 AM mountain standard. Now we just moved it to 7 AM because we're like, there's no excuse because sometimes what would end up happening is like it's spring and it's summer and we live in Colorado and I go, Hey, I'm going camping and you go, Oh, really nice today. <laughs> yeah. I like, I'm, Hey, I'm leaving, I'm leaving work early. And, uh, and then he's like, well, let's just, so now we knock it out. It's all knocked out. I can still leave early. That's how we make it happen. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, I am so glad that you reached out to me and that we could talk about this, but let's really talk a little bit about the, the business in general, because let's talk about the firm because we're hitting, we're hitting into some hard times. I've mm -hmm. been hearing some contraction. I think this is going to be like a really ideal time for your show to take off because this is the hard time when those firms that are in there less than seven years need you. Well, I'm glad you're optimistic about that part of it. I am now optimistic. Thank you for the white pill. <laughs> I didn't, I did I wasn't even thinking about that, but hopefully, uh, cause I would, that would be, that's one of the, that that is also one of the ideas behind behind the firm is when Al Al went out to New York City after graduating college worked for a very prominent world famous architect. Uh, the hint is is that I'll give you that everybody is he he was the, the the designer of the original remake of the World Trade Center towers after they got demolished. So like super famous architect. I came out to Colorado and worked for two regionally famous architects. But they both had, both of those firms had, I think, one thing in common, and that was they put all their eggs in one basket, just one doing one typology. So when it got wiped out, like these hard times that you talk about are coming up. So on our show, we've, all, we've, we've preached over and over and over again is diversity is your strength if you actually do have a diverse work set. You're not just doing one typology, right? You're, you're working for the 1%, the 2%, the 3%, like the whole thing. You can't just be focused on one single thing. And because if you only have one leg on that stool and it gets cut out, you're done. You need to have four or five. One gets cut out. It, it's no problem in that sort of way. So although those kind of like tools and ticks, tricks and, and tips and everything is what we go over on, on the show. So I hope it does take off in that kind of way for sure. Business-wise, we're, we're as we give weekly updates on what's going on economically, which is, I think, a big missing piece of the pie for architects Yeah, is you and I were talking about that before we started is like, uh, you went to RISD, I went to North Dakota State, and we did not, there was no business classes. Like yeah, there was I said there was no math, right? Or, I literally oh, took yeah. no math. That's like how bad it was. <laughs> yeah. So, so we try to really hone in the focus on that of like, hey, guys and gals, here's what's going on in the economy. And then we've even developed a couple courses beyond um, for architects that want to expand and have more legs in the stool. And one of them I think is that's it, so smart because architects love continuing education. Like they love, they all have certifications. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Architects Guide 2. And so it's architectsguide2.com. And what it teaches is it teaches you how to become a general contractor, um, which is like you like, and I'm, it's trying to focus on people who have never really swung a hammer. You know, there's, there's hacks and ways you can get in and figure out how to do those things 
and lean on your subs in that sort of way. But the whole concept with just that, if I'm focusing in on that part of this, this interview is that you can't, if you have architecture projects, right, you've already, you have such a bigger advantage over all these other general contractors, because guess what you got to do for like, however long it took to design their house, right? For example, let's say it took three months to design their house. You got to interview them. You got to interview them for three months. Yeah, you, you got, got a relationship s- built. Oh my gosh. They, maybe they are, maybe they trust you already. So there's no like skepticism or anything. And then if you present to them, like we do in the course is like, this is an open book concept kind of contract. You get to see all the bids. You get to see all of our markup. Like there's no hidden fees. You can ask me about anything. We're just openly completely transparent with the whole thing. And, and it will, and, and then if you have those architecture clients, like a, a lot of them are cash meaning like they have hundreds of thousands or even millions in the bank ready to just build. You don't even have to go through a bank sometimes to do the financing and all the draws and everything like that. If you're able to just turn, let's say four of those projects that are your architecture projects into now building projects. And let's say the architecture industry takes a crap. You have just extended the life of your firm probably a year or two with cash Mm. and how much, and how long do you really need to extend it before Maybe the federal, maybe the interest rates come down and then the economy loosens up again. Just like we saw in 2008, you only need to do it for a couple of years. Like the recessions are hard and deep, but they're short too. They're short because it picks up before in specific sectors and that's what you find. Yeah. Well, you know, Lance, this is why I think this is why I believe that you're going to be positioned in the right way because when we had the dip in like 2008 and and all of those things like that the thing that i already had going for me was speaking and so then when the dip happened again in around 2014 and we still had a little bit more dip in around there and and then into 2017 as it was getting still a little difficult we had our podcast and so it was like speaking podcasting like all of a sudden it took off for me and the next thing i know i was writing articles for ink magazine and mm. asked to do things and i had more projects than i knew what to do with and i ended up in a whole new market area from that and so i do think that you're going to ha- find another leg to the stool like you're just going to find another one in the next year. I think it's going to happen for you. I I am. So, you're just making my day. I can't tell <laughs> you like how much you're making me smile because that is one of the, was originally one of the goals. It's like, well, what if we did a podcast and we got paid to do it? Like, what if that paid for one of our salaries during a downturn? And then we could do what responsible CEOs, you know, typically do is like they, they cut their salaries if they can. And, and maybe they make profit at the end and take their dividend that way but keep their employees intact because that's like the, that's like the biggest shockwave to a small business. Maybe not a big one, but a small one for sure. Like if you have a small shop like us, we have eight architects, including me myself and Alex, our biggest asset is our employees and to and people that have been loyal to us too, for like six, seven years, you can't even replace that. Like it's impossible to replace that. They, they all the intricacies that they know, all of the past projects they can just reference for new employees to look at they know exactly what me and Alex are looking for. They know exactly how to interact with clients and all of that. So, so if you're able to keep yourself afloat in that kind of way and, and keep that intact, that's where I think that then, then when you come out of that, this next recession, we're in one for sure. But it, when you come out of it and if you can keep your team intact, but every, but most people couldn't, you're going to crush. Like then yeah. you're really going to crush. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I'm excited for your future here. I can't wait to see that and and see what's going on. And if you're out there and you're running any kind of firm agency, whether it's a law firm or not, there's a lot to learn from the conversation that Alex and Lance are having together, because I guarantee you there's similarities in your business and your business model. Well, Lance, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you. Can't wait to see what's next for Inside the Firm. And you'll have to come back and tell us all about it. 100%. 100%. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Tracy. Appreciate it. I love it when I learn something new. I, you know, I've heard of lean manufacturing. I interviewed, you know, uh, it, our engineer <laughs> on lean manufacturing already on this show. So like, you know, I've had some exposure to that, but you know, his mention of two second lean, I read the book since um I recorded this episode and I'm recording this outro afterwards. Uh, fascinating, fascinating ideas around it. So what we glean from being able to interview people, the research that we're doing, the informativeness, this is the core value of my podcast to me. It's giving me ideas into things I didn't even imagine. And it's pulling disparate ideas from different industries. And I love that about podcasting. 
I really think there's a lot of takeaways today from um, what we heard from Lance and from co-hosting, from um, building a guide to for your own industry. That's a great way to do supplement what you're doing, um, make a great way for you to get more speaking opportunities in your industry. Um, the idea that some of what he's done and how he's developed things came out of a mastermind as well. Those are some really great things. You know, doing more episodes per week, you're getting a wider audience, you're getting more feel, you can have a different focus for the show. You know, I think that that really has given them an opportunity to really expand what they're doing with inside the firm. So just some of those things are just all kinds of ideas that you should be taking away. When you listen to one of our feature brand, one of our feature brand episodes, you're getting tactics. When you're listening here to the binge factor episodes, you're getting ideas about how to apply this, right? So I really hope you're taking away those things. If you try anything that Lance suggested or something that you're modeling after a show, let us know. Reach out to Lance. Thank him for it. Be sure to listen to the show, Inside the Firm. Alex Gore, Lance Keiko, great, great show. Even if you're not that excited about the architecture industry, like I am a little fangirling on it, but you're going to get some interesting insights into ways that, that you might be able to develop it no matter what type of firm you have. So I look forward to bringing you more great podcasters, great insights into different types of podcasts as we keep going. I've got quite the list of people and really diverse ideas of what's coming through here on The Binge Factor. So I hope you'll hang out with us as we continue throughout this year exploring very, very different types of podcast as we go forward. So Lance Keiko, thank you so much for being on this show. I really appreciate you. Love Inside the Firm. Thank you for bringing your podcast into this world. You've been listening to the Binge Factor Podcast. For more information on podcasting and video casting success tips and tactics, please go to thebingefactor.com. And be sure to listen to our other show for podcasters called Feed Your Brand. If you'd like to be interviewed on this show, as well as featured in Tracy's column, please go to thebingefactor.com slash guest and apply. 